All right, welcome to another round on Adventures of Spotlights at Sustainable You. And today we're going to find out how to establish new garden space for food and flowers, understand the importance of species selection, especially when you're doing design of your landscape, and also making life easy in the garden. Yes, it's possible. And for this, what we have today with us is Brian. So for the ones that may not know, Brian is an engineering coach. He helps engineers and engineering leaders accelerate their teams, careers, and companies. His very seasoned software developer engineer, including DevOps, security infrastructure, and machine learning. So, you know, a little bit of the work that I do as out of all garden stuff. And in his free time, Brian maintains a community of food forests, mm -hmm. a triple bottom line plant nursery, and volunteers with community gardening organizations in Buffalo um, in the USA. So he's going to tell us more about all of these adventures in a minute. Um, just to say that we met through Work on Climate, which is a community, a very action-oriented Slack community for people that are serious about climate work. So you can find out more on that. And also you can follow Brian professionally on LinkedIn on um, slash I am slash engineering coach. All right, so that is really just a tiny intro. So please, Brian, tell us a bit more about yourself. What's the story behind your journey into permaculture and how software landed you here? Yeah, yeah, thank you. It's a wonderful intro. Appreciate that overview. Uh, yeah, so my sort of journey started, I don't know, maybe maybe 15 years ago or so. And I was, I was really interested in growing my own food. Um, but I had I had no idea how to do that, um, and so I, I read a lot of books and did a lot of trial and error, um, and uh, just for sort of cl uh, sort of weather climate context, right? So I'm in Buffalo, New York, which is in the sort of northeastern part of the United States, um, and so we get uh, wintertime minimum temperatures of around minus 15 Fahrenheit, um, and then summers tend to be you know maybe about 80 80 degrees um, in terms of the maximum. Um, and uh, the original sort of model of food production that I was using for myself was largely based on um, sort of large scale industrial organic methods, right? So I wasn't using um, a lot of synthetic inputs or uh, things of that nature, um, but it was still uh, modeled on a process that was very labor and machine intensive and very capital intensive. Um, and just for the size of space that I was working, I was working between maybe a quarter of an acre to a half acre, sometimes smaller, right? Sometimes more, depending on sort of where I was in life. And I started to hate gardening, which was really not good because on the one hand, like I had this love for it, like I, you know, over those years, but um, just the, the labor started to wear down on me. And so I kind of started, well, I need to figure out a way to do things a little differently, uh, methods that are less, less labor intensive, like less capital intensive, and really let me kind of dictate my schedule in the garden because I found that in the summer months the garden was dictating my schedule and you know every week I'd have to be out there weeding watering moving things around and just it was it just became it became a chore um, and I really wanted to find that joy again um, and so that's that's kind of what brought me to where I am today and I think the way that sort of manifests itself right now so I have a, a about a quarter acre uh, sort of community food forest and orchard in my neighborhood. That uh, was a big inspiration for kind of the process. Uh, it's sort of a big testing laboratory for me in terms of like how to do things in a lower impact way. Because I used to grow all this food and give it out to the neighborhood, but then I was exhausted and I figured, well, I still want to give food to the neighborhood, but I want to do it in a way that's a little more sustainable for me and my energy levels. Yeah. And then I also have a small uh, quarter acre plant nursery where I grow a lot of, uh, a lot of starter plants and a lot of small two inch landscape plugs um, to get folks started in their own gardens um, is another way of sort of minimizing the labor on their ends. Yeah, and that kind of uh, all kind of combines itself into sort of a, I guess, a collection of, of tools and techniques, um, sort of from planning and assessment all the way through, you know, longer term maintenance. You tell us yeah. a little bit where where in the world are you uh, and a little bit also how the temperatures maybe swing around. Um we are in the UK and actually I, I like to do these sessions normally outside mm -hmm. and today you brought us the sunshine which is wonderful but unfortunately we have a lot of uh, noise going on of like cats and grass uh, next mm -hmm. door so uh, hence the background uh, of where we are but anyway before I dive 
anything else in your area uh, specific for the audience to be aware something that is specific for you so we've got yeah i've got really rough soil it's heavy clay um it uh it dries out kind of quickly it's it's sort of difficult to work in um uh, so that's soil profile. Uh, rain, we get a decent amount of rainfall. Um, can kind of you can go a, a gardening season without necessarily having to water if you kind of plan things um, the right way. But often can can require some supplemental irrigation if you're doing like intensive vegetable production. In terms of environment, yeah, definitely having to adapt to changing weather patterns. Um, so uh, we're getting just I don't know. Uh, strange seasons where sometimes trees will bloom in the winter when they shouldn't, but it gets like 60 degrees for a week and they think it's spring and they start to wake up. And uh, likewise, we, we get some uh, occasional uh, sort of far out storms uh, in like early May. Um, but typically we've got like a growing season of about, you know, maybe a May, first week of May to, you know, maybe middle of October. Um, so there's a decent amount of space there between first frost um, and last frost. Um, but there's a little bit more variability um, on the tail ends of that and the beginning and the end. So, so I'm curious of all your, you know, your uh, tiredness and coming from having to do loads in the garden to hopefully coming to the point where you're doing, you know, as you mentioned, that low effort techniques. What's mm -hmm. What was your kind of big, biggest time saver or biggest um, maybe low effort technique? I think for me, the big, the one of the biggest transitions that I that I tried to make that I think got me a lot of really positive results, but was also difficult conceptually from the model I was coming from was was actually reducing and eliminating um, roto, uh, tillage with a rototiller. I kind of mentioned that really tough soil uh, a little earlier, and um, when preparing beds, right, either when it's a new bed or an established bed, uh, I was often using the rototiller as a mechanism of weed control. But in the process, right, weed control and also preparing the, the seed bed, but in the, in the process, mix around all that organic matter. Uh, and then that organic matter would start to oxidize and it would decompose much quicker um, and it would leave less organic matter in the soil, um, which especially from an organic perspective, less impactful methods and sort of less synthetic methods, that organic matter is really essential in terms of uh, water retention, soil structure, right? And root formation, um, nutrition, um, and also like microbial communities um, to help form some of those um, host resilience to, to other sort of pests and diseases, but also right through those like mycorrhizal fungal networks to also aid in, in nutritional uptake and, um, and water uptake. And so that was kind of the biggest thing that I tried to eliminate was the use of the rototiller. Also, my rototiller was always breaking and I would spend all this time fixing machinery and that's not what I wanted to do with my life. So I think the big way that I managed that transition um, came down to the use of tarps and, and geotextile landscape fabric, not necessarily as a permanent installation, but as a temporary installation for, uh, you know, about four weeks um, in the beginning of the year to sort of kill the grass, right, kill any weeds that were remaining. Um, and then in some cases, uh, leaving it on top uh, throughout the growing season, um, and then punching holes in the fabric for uh, if I were using annual crops, you know, peppers, tomatoes, watermelons, things of that nature, that was kind of one of the big methods, right. And then so, uh, because the other thing is, I was constantly adding compost, right? I would add compost. I would, you know, I'd add a cubic yard of compost. I'd go and I'd row to till a year or two later, all that compost had evaporated into thin air, right? Because of all the oxidization and from all the tillage. And then I would have to go buy more compost and spread more compost. And it got to the point where I'm like, I need to start buying heavy machinery just to move all this compost. Um, but by reducing, by reducing and eliminating tillage, uh, I was able to uh, reduce the burn rate or the consumption rate on the compost. So I think that was uh, sort of a, a, a really, a really big shift um, was just starting to eliminate tillage. But then, then I started thinking, well, how can I, how can I reduce the operations of having to tarp areas and untarp areas and, and manage pests and disease? And so part of that then got into more perennial establishments, right? And so um, we often think of perennial establishments in terms of flowers, which is great, but also, right, there's there's space for that in, in food production as well. So a lot of the gardening that I've done is I, I started shifting away from like these intensive vegetable crops, at least on a larger scale, and shifting to more landscape oriented trees and shrubs and, um, you know, brambles and things of that nature. I could tarp an area off, I could uh, kill all the grass, I could plant these longer lived species 
And then I could just throw a bunch of wood chips and mulch on top and they would kind of do their thing, you know, for the next three, four or five, six years um, without much intervention. And then all of that additional mulch on top became sort of a, a very slow, slow release, long-term, essentially nutrition source for the microbial communities. And then eventually for the, the perennial crops that I was establishing. So that was, I think that was one thing. Um, I can always, feel free to interrupt me, but I'll just, I'll just keep babbling on um, in terms of other things that I kind of, I found. Um, so I think also in shifting to thinking about sort of those perennial establishments, actually, I tend to go above and beyond the plant density recommendations. So if you look on the back of a seed packet and it says space these at, you know, 12 inches apart, you know, two feet apart, um, I tend to actually plant a little denser. Um, especially when I'm doing, uh, sort of flower beds and things of that nature. Um, because I find that there comes a point where you can establish a certain amount of density. It's harder for weeds to take root. So, um, if I'm establishing a flower bed, you know, I won't plant my flowers every 10, 12, 16 inches apart. Um, even if they'll grow to fill that space eventually, what I'll do is I'll actually plant them at like four inch, three inch spacings initially. So they fill in that space much faster. Um, and they kind of form a little, you know, sort of defensive grid from sort of other encroaching species that I might not want in that space. Do you then move them around? Uh, I might sometimes, but oftentimes I'll just leave them there. Um, and so then th that's kind of why I started using, growing a lot of those two inch um, nursery landscape plugs. Is it sort of the most efficient way to get lots of small plants ready to go once that bed is prepared and they establish that space and they take it up really quickly. So I prefer to actually plant lots of small, small plants instead of doing fewer, larger plants. And I find that saves me a lot of time and effort um, and usually expense uh, in the long run. So that's how I think about that. But um, <laughs> yeah, you got, you got me going one simple question and now I'm off Good. to the races. Um, I think the other thing I would just, I would mention real quick too, is, is, is really thinking about like a, integrating like somatics, right? And like how your body is moving through space and time into your assessment and placement of your garden, right? So I find that if I plant- I love, Sorry, <laughs> I love how casually you just say that because that's a fairly massive subject, isn't it? But <laughs> please go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, so for, you know, just like a short example, right? Like I take my dog outside every morning and I go out the side door. Um, to let him run around in the yard and, you know, throw a Frisbee with him or whatever. And if I put my more intensive, more maintenance heavy plants right near that, that, that entrance and exit where I go at every morning, I'm much more likely to keep up on maintenance in a way that just feels effortless because I just walk out the door, I see something little and I fix it, right? I see a, a, some grass growing, I pull it out, right? I see something needs watering, I just, you know, throw a cup of water on it. You know, really, really thinking about like how your body wants to move in larger establishments as well, right? So I tend to do more narrow uh, sort of rows, right? Of maybe 24 inches to maybe, you know, 32 inches maximum, because I find it's easier for me to get both feet sort of over the rows. Whereas if I do these wider four foot, five foot rows, I'm now doing a lot of bending and straining, things of that nature. And similarly with, you know, something like if you are getting a compost delivery, right? If you're establishing new space and you really want to build up that organic matter and you want to bring in some external amendments, how is that delivery driver going to get to where your garden is? And do you want to have to move all of that material <laughs> if they can't get to where, where you're, you're going to be placing things? So in terms of thinking about, right, like spacing and, and design, right, like really just trying to be mindful of like how your body wants to move. Um, so I find that that is a like just it gives me like a huge uptick in, in efficiency, but also just like overall ease and effort. So when you have yeah. a new space and you are start looking of how, where things will go, how do you make these decisions in early stages where you may not know enough about the space? So I, that's a great question. I think you should always feel free to iterate and, and change as you go. But I mean, so when I'm thinking about establishing a new space, I'm thinking about, you know, how much sunlight is this going to get? Whereabouts in the world am I located and what species are going to be well adapted to that site? So, and, and what, what the soil's like. Um, so for example, you know, if I am in a shady area, I probably don't want to plant a bunch of sun-loving crops like peppers and tomatoes, but I might do really well with like leafy greens and things of that nature. Um, likewise, if the soil is really heavy, like very heavy clay, if I start trying to plant carrots, 
I'm never going to get them out of the soil. They're just going to snap off uh, as soon as I try to pull them out. And then I think about the time of the year that I'm trying to get this established. So normally what I'll do, right, is I'll, I will take an area and I'll just, I'll mark it out with just some stakes um, so I can get some kind of references for measurements. And I think about like, what are the landmarks that I can use as visual references sort of when I'm planning out my garden? So, you know, I have a fence around my yard uh, and I know those fence posts are spaced every eight feet. So I know that if I if I center my rows on one of those fence posts, right, it's gonna be it's gonna be an eight foot spacing, and so I can kind of cut things up. Thinking about what I want to plant there, right, is then gonna have me think a little bit more about like what I want to do with that space, right? So usually I'm always gonna tarp it first for four to six weeks, depending on how warm it is that time of year to kill all of the the grass underneath. But then also thinking about is this close to water? Is this far away from water? you know, what kinds of things are going to be, are going to be suitable for planting in that time of year and for sort of my long-term vision for that space. So, yeah, I mean, I think, I think, right, like how much, how often am I going to be in that space? How much effort am I willing to put into that space? And what are the species um, and plant types that are suitable to sort of the, the environmental conditions of soil, water, sun, um, but also sort of overall disease and microbial resistance. One of the reasons why I plant a lot of native species um, in my region is that they're, they, they've co-evolved with uh, the pests, right? So if I plant peach trees, I, I have a couple of peach trees in my yard and I love peaches, but I have to spray them with copper uh, three times a year. Otherwise they get a ton of uh, peach leaf curler, which is a fungus, which completely strips the leaves off the tree. But if I plant native species like a pawpaw or blueberries or blackberries, They've co-evolved with the, the 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 local pests and the the local ecology, so I, I really don't have to do much with them other than you know maybe some occasional pruning or uh, you know adding on some new mulch or something to that effect. So when I'm thinking about establishing a new space, that's kind of the the process that I run through and sort of how I'm thinking about establishing a new environment. Hmm. I wonder with the peaches if there is something you could be planting nearby just to deter. Hmm. Uh, to confuse and deter, that's normally what we try to do over here, okay. rather than uh, adding more um, external inputs into it. How can we confuse the heck out of whoever is interested? Yeah, I mean, so I think, again, a lot of that goes back to like species and, and cultivar selection, right? So, uh, and understanding the uh, life cycle of the pests and diseases in question. So there are some varieties of say, you know, peach trees or apple trees that have, have more resistance to certain kinds of uh, diseases. Granted, uh, you're not gonna find those in like your local large garden center home improvement store. You typically have to find those direct through like a specialty nursery, um, but you can find lots of those folks online. But really understanding like the disease profile that's susceptible and understanding the, the life cycle of of those diseases. So um, the peaches in question, um, right, the the fungus that I, I'm referring to, right, um, it sort of lives in the, you know, kind of on the soil surface and as wind and water and things, it, it blows it up and then it, it sets on the buds. Um, and so the reason why that, that spray timing has to happen three times, it has to happen sort of once in the winter and two in the spring, and it has to happen before those buds emerge because otherwise the fungal spores will start to start to germinate um, just as those buds are emerging um, and it'll infect the leaf tissue. And once it infects the leaf tissue, it just strips everything from the tree. So really understanding like the local disease pressure um, and buying the right species that can be well adapted um, genetically um, to resist those pressures is like a huge step, right? Um, there and then there are some like cultural controls right so if you're pruning a lot of those diseases tend to live on dead or dying tissue um and so removing that dead or dying tissue from uh the area so if i'm pruning those peach trees uh to get a different form or open up the canopy not leaving those dead branches on the ground because those tend to harbor harbor disease right those tend to be a disease vector so getting those and moving those off site um you know some, you know, 30 meters away or something. And then I think the other thing too, right, is like in understanding the the disease life cycle, right? How can you affect the environmental conditions to disrupt the disease life cycle, those pests, right? So if a fungus or a bacteria thrives in high moisture environments, opening up that tree canopy to allow more airflow 
um, is going to reduce the susceptibility of uh, sort of a large uh, pathogenic community within that tree canopy, right? Likewise, in instances where um, those uh, pathogens may live on the soil surface, sometimes adding a protective layer of mulch every year can kind of help disrupt um, or prevent some of that from, from blowing up into the canopy. It's not necessarily uh, foolproof, right? But it, it can uh, help cut down on the disease pressure a little bit. So in terms of thinking about those kinds of strategies, right, when it, when it comes to sort of fungi and bacteria, right, I'm, I'm largely thinking about things like the environmental conditions that are going to support their growth and what can I be doing to reduce, you know, to, to modify the environment um, to reduce their ability to grow. With insect-based diseases or insect-based pests and, you know, herbivores and things of that nature, yeah, I mean, some of that can be can be other similar environmental modifications, but also, uh, you know, as you mentioned, kind of some of that can be things like trap crops or, um, you know, certain uh, things to try to pull, pull that. So I have woodchucks that love to eat my watermelons. And uh, if I plant those near where the woodchucks live, they're just going to shred it. I'm not going to get any melons that year. But if I plant them far away and I plant something kind of near where the woodchucks like to hang out that the woodchucks will eat, sometimes that's just enough where they won't go try and find my watermelons, but they'll eat like alfalfa or something instead. So, um, you know, there's a, a balance there. But yeah, that's that's how I tend to think about that. I was going to say about our nasturtions, how they were our sacrifice plant, but actually they're just absolutely thriving and last year they got destroyed this year they're yeah as you can see in Ennis's background it's basically uh yeah it's huge and we've had to start eating them because <laughs> it's just getting worse and worse there is no insect that wants to enjoy an nasturtium this year okay. yeah um, because they brought like a family so normally you get um more attention to the nasturtiums versus maybe your cabbages or something else but this year yeah. is the other way around so uh, it not work Nasturtium capers, nasturtium salads, flower salad, pesto with mm. the leaves, you know, there is, you know, if there are abundance, you must do something with it. Yeah. Right. Right. But it's, it's funny that you say about the woodchucks, because we, I think it was yesterday or the day before, just, we've got our first two or three watermelons. They're very small at the moment, but we saw the other day that hedgehogs love watermelons. And we're okay. like, oh no, I love hedgehogs, but I've, you know to sample my first watermelon will be amazing I'll be a bit upset if I see a little hedgehog in there having a party yeah <laughs> <laughs> so if I can tap into something you mentioned earlier which is um food forest to agroforestry yeah. I I really really love this idea of plant once mm -hmm. let it do its own devices and yeah. fruitful forever and um, also there are some species that you can get legumes. It's not all just mm -hmm. fruits and nuts, but there are other things you can do. So when you are thinking about it, or you're designing around it, what sort of like pitfalls or common mistakes or things that works really well? Like if somebody mm -hmm. had a little bit of space, quarter of an acre or something, and wants to establish some food forestry, tell us, how do they go about it? So I would start by thinking about, you know, what are the things you like to eat? right? First and foremost. Um, and then I would start thinking about what are the plants that are going to be well adapted um, and not require a lot of maintenance. So again, like what things do really well in your, in your area without a lot of intervention. Um, and then I would start thinking also three-dimensionally, right? Uh, sometimes I refer to it as like stacking, right? So you, because uh, especially as you're, because if you're thinking food forest, you're generally thinking long time frame. Right. So, you know, for example, right. So like in the, the spot that I maintain, right. So I have, it's, it's essentially just rows, which was just done uh, partly for, for, for my ease, but also because uh, there are these big tractors that the city of Buffalo uses to mow grass. And sometimes they don't necessarily respect property boundaries. And so if I don't put it in a row, sometimes they just mow all my stuff over. Anyway, so when I'm thinking about that, right. So I have sort of on the sides, uh, I have these large uh, cottonwoods which are, are purely ornamental, um, but they grow very, very fast. They grow like, you know, maybe three to four feet a year um, in height. And when that does, that helps me just really establish a sense of space very quickly and a sense of a, a border. In the in-between the rows, I have um, a mixture of uh, pawpaws, which are a fruit native to this region, uh, service berries, another fruit native to this region. And then I have um, some pea shrubs, which are not native to this region, but are well adapted um, and, and happen to be a legume 
Um, so they get some good kind of nitrogen fixing going on there. And then um, I have a couple other like things scattered throughout there, um, sort of on the low maintenance, uh, sort of genetically resistant side of things um, in the rows. And then in the back, right, where it gets a little more shady, it's kind of on the property boundary, I plant uh, a lot of blackberries around there, right? And so I kind of have these blackberries in the back. I have these large sort of majestic cottonwoods on the sides really defining the space. Then I have these rows in the middle of these like highly uh, disease resistant, no maintenance uh, fruit trees. Um, the other thing though that I, that I did, right? So when I, when I planted that, you know, I basically laid out, I, uh, it was kind of a tar, I kind of took a modified tarping method. So what I would normally do is, is tarp out that row, um, for about six weeks, kill everything underneath it, come back, plant into it, and then put my mulch on top. In this instance, I actually had a lot of mulch. Um, so if you have anyone in your area that runs a tree service company that does maintenance, become best friends with them. Uh, because they'll usually give you wood chips for free. Um, and so I had just an inordinate amount of wood chips. Um, and there was also a local coffee roaster that gets rid of all these, these burlap sacks of coffee. So I had maybe 500 coffee bags and, you know, 50 cubic yards of wood chips. And so, um, so after sort of planting the tree, what I would do is I would take the, the burlap and I would layer it um, around the trees um and so i would do you know maybe three layers of burlap sack um and sort of get good good coverage and overlap and then i would dump you know maybe six to eight inches of mulch um on top of that burlap and that was an incredibly effective weed suppression technique and it also is becoming a long-term nutrition source now granted the one one tricky thing is you want to make sure that that burlap doesn't stick out of the edges because if you try to mow the grass uh, and you catch that burlap, it's going to, it's going to stop your lawnmower pretty quickly. Uh, the other thing that I did with that, right in that process, because I had all of that, all of those wood chips sitting there, um, a friend of mine has a small, uh, mushroom farm, uh, in the city of Buffalo there do, uh, they would grow oyster mushrooms on, um, but all of that mycelium is still living, still, still living and alive. Um, and so I mixed that into the wood chip piles or the wood chip mulch surrounding the trees. Um, and so then for the first couple of years that mycelium would spread out and start decomposing the wood chips. Um, but then I'd also get a lot of oyster mushrooms, right? So I kind of have this, this three dimensional space where I've got sort of this, uh, and the, I guess the other thing that I'm starting to do is I'm starting to train hardy kiwi up the cottonwoods now that the cottonwoods are of a certain height. So hardy kiwi is a, like a very cold tolerant, uh, kind of grape size member of the kiwi family. Um, that grows in this region. And so I'm using those cottonwoods as kind of support poles for this vining plant. And then I have the kind of, you know, smaller fruit trees in the middle. And then underneath that, I have sort of the mushrooms growing in the, in the, the wood chip substrate. But, you know, those mushrooms, you could substitute those for strawberries or flowers or whatever your, your sort of preferred uh, design criteria. So when I'm thinking about establishing a space like that, I'm thinking like, what is the long-term sort of goal of the space? What are the things that I can do to sort of provide long-term nutrition, right, in terms of those wood chips? Um, and how can I think three-dimensionally about the what's growing there and things of that nature? So that's that's how I think about it. I don't know. I hope that's, hope that's a, a, an answer. But. Yeah, I have a, I have a technical question. I fear yeah. I might look a bit silly here, but I'm just going to ask it anyway. You keep talking about the, the tarp, which... Yeah. My understanding is tarp is either is like more of a man-made kind of material. Um, and then you keep saying you layer on wood chip on top. Uh, what, how does that then decompose into the, the soil? Yeah, so, so with that example, so I would tarp it just to get a really good grass kill. And then I would remove the tarp. So remove like the okay. plastic tarp. And then I put the burlap on top. Um, that said there are these really interesting uh, new kinds of agricultural um, tarps that are, that are bioplastics. They're actually made out of corn. Um, and I haven't really done enough trials with them yet to know how well I like them. Um, but they're, they're essentially, it's just a big sheet of, of corn plastic. Um, and so those you actually can lay down um, and then, you know, put compost or wood chips right on top and they'll just, they'll, you know, turn into decomposed corn in, you know, six, eight months. So uh okay okay right that that's uh yeah i realize that that makes sense now sorry about that <laughs> oh no it's a great question 
what we have become in the village is the um, recycling center for all cardboard. So any sort of piece of cardboard, mm. we just take it and that's what we use instead. The worms love it. So you get mm. lots of activity going on. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah. Use what you got on hand. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Great. So, uh, I mean, we've talked a lot about the, you know, tools and techniques that you use in your garden, in your your um, food forest, sorry, or fruit, fruit forest. Um, so if we're thinking about like the low effort from our backyard through to our communities, how sort of sustainable is it in, in general across the board? Like just give us your wisdom on that. Yeah, how how sustainable is it? I guess I guess help me with more clarification on the it. Are we? Uh, what's the what's the it? Um, Inna, so can you elaborate a little bit more on the sustainability side of it? Yeah, I suppose we had Hannah over, and I really like how she sort of we talk about sustainability this and that, but it's just the ability to sustain. Mm-hmm. And so when you're doing something, especially like the forestry efforts with the community. How, what are the other things or pieces of the puzzles that enables that ability to sustain? Mm, yeah, what enables the ability to sustain? So for me, really kind of comes from a perspective of like, what do these organisms need, right? And not just like the organisms in the garden, but the organisms maintaining the garden uh, and the organisms surrounding the garden, right? For you know, like the plots of, you know, like a food forest or a community garden to be sustainable, you know, I mean, there's, there's the, the needs of each, each plant, right. And it's kind of nutritional, nutritional sun requirements, maintenance requirements. And there's the, the needs of the gardener um, in terms of how much time do I really have and how much energy do I have? And, and what is it about this process that I like? And what is it about this process that I don't like? And where can I find the space to align what I'm doing and what these things need with what I like to do and and not so much what I don't like to do. Um, and so, you know, I, I did not particularly like, you know, doing, spending time fixing machinery and tilling, tilling up, uh, you know, organic matter. Right. So, um, but I did like looking at trees and I like you know, digging a hole and putting one thing in there and walking away. So, and, you know, I didn't really like having to do lots of detailed pest management. So I just started to look for things that wouldn't require that. And then in terms of, you know, sort of bigger, you know, systems integrations, right? I mean, uh, you know, I'm I'm always, I I also don't like spending money. Um, So I (laughs) I look for opportunities to find things that that other people are are getting rid of that help support those other needs, right? So um, the wood chips from the tree service companies, when there's a big storm, they just give me a call because they know I'll always take their wood chips. Um, it saves them the trip and the fuel of having to go dump them somewhere out in the middle of nowhere. And then it, it helps me, you know, grow all of the, the stuff that I'm interested in growing. And then, you know, like with the, the burlap coffee sacks, those are just going to go in a landfill, um, if I don't use them for something. So, um, there's a nice little added benefit there. And then, you know, there's, uh, one of the things about, uh, I think sustainability too, is also like when we're thinking about sustainability, not just in the micro, but in the macro, you know, what is, what is the capacity for this, sh- this space towards opening up a sense of new possibility and, and shifting mindset, right? People see what I'm doing and they lose their minds because they're like, oh my God, I've never seen anything like this before. What is going on? Like, you're just giving away all this food. This is great. I love this. If you ever need anything, let me know. Right. I'm like, oh, I don't need anything at the moment, but, but thank you. Right. Yeah. So I don't know, I guess, I guess in terms of the, but but really none of that is possible, right? If if I am just exhausted and burnt out all the time and thinking, oh, I don't want to have to go do this task or that thing. And when things start to become a chore, that's when, you know, the whole process for me starts to fall apart. So so I, I really try to focus on like, how can I make sustainability easy? How can I make sustainability a low lift? Um, and how can I really make that align with sort of what naturally works for me? So. Yeah, I think those are great lessons. And if I was to start gardening again or growing my own food, <laughs> it would be make myself easy because the amount of trips and moving things around and all that time and effort, obviously, and muscle effort. Um, so I think at this point, it would be quite nice um, to find out more about the community project, like the orchard and how how that come about and how did you get involved and everything. Yeah, so I mean, the the lot, you know, the the community sort of uh, food forest that I maintain, 
that was kind of just a passion project. It kind of just had a vision. Um, and there used to be a time where in the neighborhood where I'm in, where like real estate was not worth anything and nobody wanted to live here. And so I was able to buy the land that the the orchard is on or the, the community food, food, food forest is on um, for, you know, almost next to nothing. I think it was maybe like 2000 US dollars or something at the time, right? Um, for land in the middle of a city, right? And that that was really just a part of like a vision that I had, right? And something that I wanted to see in the world. Uh, th there was a time in my life where I was I was sort of a leftist radical in Buffalo and I used to work as a community organizer. Um, and so I would literally knock on people's doors and say, hey, can I talk to you about, you know, X, Y, and Z an environmental issue, um, usually focused on industrial pollution um, and uh, hazardous waste, things of that nature, and also some stuff around budget democracy. So I kind of just got out around town and met a lot of people. Yeah. And so, I mean, in terms of, uh, you know, other other community projects, right, like it just, you know, through those relationships, I guess I just have friends that like to do interesting things, right? So, um, you know, I did a tree planting day with some, uh, there's a teen science scholars program at a local science museum here. And a friend of mine over there is a program coordinator. And so we brought all of his kids out here to plant trees in the neighborhood. And, you know, it was great. They get paid to go into a neighborhood and plant a bunch of trees, right? And um, looking at seeing if we can plan some, you know, doing some pollinator gardens uh, in the neighborhood as well. Um, yeah, and then there's just, uh, you know, there's just some good organizations in town that I just, I like to support, um, you know, when and where I can, whether that's with my time or whether that's, you know, uh, with my finances. One, one of my mentors early, uh, earlier in life told me, Brian, if you love something, uh, feed it and watch it grow. Uh, and that was sort of a metaphor that I, I try to uh, take with me in sort of a lot of different aspects of life. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe a bit of a divergence from the initial question, but that's that's where my mind goes. So, I love it. It's always so much to do. I think sometimes at work or in life, we think we need to get really good at one thing. And in fact, we can do a lot of things. I'm a generalist and I like it. And, you know, you get ideas from this to the other. And when you were talking about uh, try something and iterate and make it better like this is software right it's not just yeah. gardening right yeah exactly so. um so any upcoming adventures sort of uh, any plans is coming up to time uh, or and some last words of wisdom yeah you know i would say that nothing nothing super major coming up on my end i would say if anybody out there is looking for a, a coach to help accelerate their engineering uh teams or their, their career feel free to reach out to me and if there's any gardeners in the u.s uh watching you need some uh perennial flower uh plants go to go to zubaplants.com z-u-b-a plants.com and um other than that um you know that's that's all I got on my mind. It was great to it was great to sit down with y'all and and talk about about things I love. So that's I guess I guess if I had my word of wisdom, it would be yeah I don't know, try to find more space in your life for the things you love. So thank you, Brian. Thank yeah. you so much. Lots of food for thought and rewatching all the different tips. Uh, I think you gave us a lot in a short amount of time. And yeah, for the rest, uh, you know how this rolls. In two weeks, we're going to have another video ready for you, a sustainable year. Thank you very much, everyone, and see you very soon.